taken from the Ultimate Killer Collection, by Stuart Dandel. Derek Bird The Cumbria Shootings Derek Bird was the youngest of three boys. He was born with his twin brother David, on the 27th of November, 1957, to Joseph and Mary Bird. Growing up he met a local girl, Linda Mills, at school. Eventually the pair settled down as a couple and had two sons. They never married and the relationship started to crumble, ending in the early 90s. Bird then moved into a pebble-terraced house in the village of Rora, and lived a quiet, respectable life as a taxi driver. According to the people who lived nearby, Bird, 52, was the perfect neighbor, quiet, popular, and fun to be with. When buying a pint of milk at his local shop, he would always pay with a pound and leave the change. He was the sort of guy that when passing anyone on the street, he would stop to say hello. So what could cause the perfect neighbor to become a killer, what would cause such a mild-mannered man to explode? On the 2nd of June, 2010, Derek Bird snapped and began a murderous journey that would result in 30 different crime scenes, several murders, and with him taking his own life in the picturesque Hamlet of Boot. On the fateful morning he set off from his home in Rora in his silver Citroen Picasso towards his twin brother David's home at High Trees Farm in Lampleyug. Arriving in the early hours he let himself in, walked up the stairs to his brother's bedroom, and coldly shot him eleven times while he was asleep in bed. At around quarter past five in the morning, Derek Bird was then seen on CCTV footage driving to the house of his family solicitor Kevin Commons, in Frisington. At nearly 10.15 am, Commons, who was 60, left his front door to find his car blocked in by Bird. Without warning Bird shot him twice, once in the shoulder, and then again in the head. The attack was witnessed by a horrified neighbor. Armed with a 12-bore sawn-off shotgun and a .22 rifle fitted with a telescopic sight, Bird then headed back to Rora to try and pick up another gun he left with a friend. Fortunately, the key to the gun cupboard couldn't be found. Not knowing what danger she was in, his friend's wife offered Bird a cup of tea. Bird refused and left. At about 10.30 am, Bird arrived in Whitehaven and shot dead taxi driver Darren Rucastle. He also shot taxi drivers Terry Kennedy, Donald Reed, and Paul Wilson, though they all survived. Kennedy however, had to have his right hand amputated. Hearing the shots being fired, a local neighborhood police officer saw Bird's taxi with a shotgun pointing out of the front passenger window. Alarmed, he alerted other officers to the situation and it's only then, that the police realize a gunman is on the loose. They respond by diverting all Cumbria police officers to try and intercept the mobile shooter, but Bird has an excellent knowledge of the local roads and is always one step ahead. The neighborhood police officer bravely attempted to follow Bird in a car that pulled over to let him in. Terrifyingly. They witness an incident as Bird shoots at another couple when their oncoming car passes his sitter in Picoso. Offering assistance to the injured couple the neighborhood officer left the pursuit, while another unmarked police car took up the chase. However, the officers become trapped when Bird maneuvers into a driveway. He points his gun at them and then drives off at high speed. Around the time the police were pursuing Bird and being threatened with firearms, public warnings were issued throughout the Lake District, focusing on Whitehaven, Egremont, and Seascale. At 11 a.m., the killer's brother, David Bird's body is found by his neighbor. All the while, Derek Bird continued his spree through the town of Egremont, where he callously shot dead pensioner Kenneth Fishburn, someone he had never met. This was followed by the mindless shooting murder of Susan Hughes, 57, who'd been walking home after doing her morning shopping. The terrifying issue for the people of Cumbria then was, Derek Bird appeared to be picking his victims at random. Nobody was safe. Reaching the village of Wilton, Bird sounded his horn outside the home of Jason Carey. 
Carey was a member of the local diving club who Bird had had a falling out with, and he was here now to remonstrate that fact. Carey had the luckiest day of his life when he didn't answer the door and Bird drove off without inevitably claiming his life. Bird's next victims aren't so lucky however, Jennifer Jackson, 68, and her husband James, 67, are both shot dead. After arriving in Carlton Wood, Bird murdered Isaac Dixon, who was the part-time mill catcher who had just been having a friendly chat to a local farmer. This was yet another bystander's life tragically taken for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Next Bird headed to Gosforth and came across Gary Purdom, 31, trimming hedges in his field. It is believed that Bird's method to kill his victims, was to call them over to his car and then shoot them in the face, a cowardly way of killing. Gary Purdom died on the spot. The random trail of destruction and murder continued when Bird arrived in Seascale, a small coastal Cumbrian town. This is also the site where he took the life of his youngest victim, estate agent Jamie Clark, who was 23. After being shot at Jamie crashed his car, though it was the gunfire that killed him. At around 11.30 am, Bird murdered cyclist Michael Pike, 64, and then went on to murder his final victim, Jane Robinson, 66, who was in the wrong place at the wrong time delivering catalogs. Both these victims died after suffering gunshot wounds. Making his escape and heading for the Eskdale Valley, Bird opened fire on six more individuals, injuring another three. After that he pulled up to a tourist, asked her if it's a nice day, and then shot her in the face. She survived, but wisely played dead until Bird's car had disappeared. Finally with petrol getting low, a blown tire on his front wheel, and running out of ammunition, Bird made his final journey to a popular beauty spot in Boot, Dr. Bridge. After dumping his car, terrified tourist Lee Turner asked him if he needed any help. Bird refused and headed off on foot with his rifle. The final reported sighting of Bird was a man looking dejected with hunched shoulders. Police found his body at around 1.30 p.m. He had managed to end the spree on his own terms. Police were then left guessing as to why this apparently quiet, upstanding member of the community, would not only murder 12 people in cold blood, and injure 11 more in a deadly shooting spree, but also then take his own life. Answers were needed. At the inquest, on 1 March, 2011, in Workington, further details emerged, hinting at what could have caused this tragic course of events. Looking through his employment history, police discovered that Bird had previously worked as a joiner at Sellafield Nuclear Plant in Cumbria. But in 1990, he was caught stealing from his employer and was promptly sacked for the offense. Convicted of this crime, but scared of going to jail, he was given a 12-month suspended sentence. The fact that a few of Bird's victims worked for Sellafield may not have been a complete coincidence. The theft conviction however, doesn't affect his ability to own guns. Theresa May, the then Home Secretary of the UK, confirmed that Derek Bird was a legal licensed owner. This came as a shock to the neighborhood, who had no idea that Derek Bird even owned such weapons. It was later revealed that the guns were left to Bird in a will when his father died. Bird renewed his shotgun license in 1995, and again in 2007 for his .22 rifle. After losing his job in the early 90s, Bird took up employment as a local taxi driver. He was known to be a quiet guy, so some friends found this to be an odd career choice. In 2007 he was assaulted by a passenger trying to dodge his fare at night. This left Bird both physically and mentally scarred, also destroying his self-confidence. The other taxi drivers played upon this and he became the butt of their practical jokes. In an incident while on holiday in Thailand with Terry Kennedy, a practical joke was played. Knowing that Bird enjoyed raiding the fridge after night out, soap blocks were put in a bowl. 
Bird returned and happily munched on them until he realized what they were. Unfortunately for Terry, Bird is a man who can hold a grudge. The jokes went too far when Bird's tires were slashed, he was drenched in coffee, and milk was poured in his taxi. According to witnesses, the other drivers also wound Bird up by jumping the queue to take his fares. Two days before the shootings John McDonald remembered Bird saying, they are going to get it big style. You just watch. This would appear to be an ominous forewarning. During the investigation the police were particularly perplexed by the murder of Bird's twin brother, and the family solicitor Kevin Commons. But answers are soon forthcoming. It emerged that Bird was being investigated for tax evasion by HMRC. Neil Jax, Bird's best friend, revealed that Bird hadn't paid tax for 15 years since becoming a taxi driver, and was absolutely petrified of going to jail. Noticing his anxiety, Kevin Commons put Bird in contact with an accountant, Peter L. Wood, so that he could help with Bird's tax issues. A meeting was set up between Bird and Elwood on the 21st of May, 2010. It was here that Elwood warned Bird that the maximum amount the HMRC will ask for is £25,000, if they draw back 15 years to when he first started as a taxi driver. He also made it clear that Bird has over £50,000 in savings, so the debt can easily be paid. This information was also corroborated by Detective Constable Catherine Rogerson who confirmed that Bird was financially secure. Supposedly the meeting ended with Bird feeling extremely concerned that he might lose his home. This is despite Elwood trying to reassure him that this wouldn't be the case. He then felt that Bird had stopped listening to him. Another meeting was scheduled for the morning of the 2nd of June. But by this point Bird's paranoia had persuaded him that his brother David, and solicitor Kevin Commons, were plotting against him. Bird was not only convinced that the meetings were being taped, but that he would be arrested on the 2nd June and sent to prison. It transpired that in 1997, David Bird was in financial difficulty. A year before their dad Joseph died, he gave David £25,000 on the understanding that it would be paid back. After their father's death, David never paid the money back. This left Eric Bird with a grudge, especially as he was the one in financial difficulties, and also his ailing mom's full-time carer. By early 2010, Derek Bird had become depressed by his elderly mother's ill health and terrified he would be sent to prison for tax evasion. Peter McLean, a member of Bird's Sabacla Club, remembered Bird chillingly saying a month before the shootings that, Whitehaven will be as famous as Dunblane, you will see soon enough. At the time he had no idea what Bird was talking about. During the inquest Dr. David Rogers commented that there was no history of Derek Bird ever being diagnosed with mental health issues. Psychologist Dr. West summed up his analysis of Bird and believed that he shot 12 people dead because he wanted revenge for his own failings. He felt that Bird was ordinary but held grudges. As to why he targeted his own brother and family solicitor, Dr. West announced that it was because of his mistaken belief that they were conspiring against him. His attacks against the taxi drivers were probably due to the fact he felt humiliated, and he went on to shoot random strangers because he wanted to gain notoriety and put Whitehaven on the map. The jury returned 12 verdicts of unlawful killing on Bird's victims, and a verdict of suicide for Derek Bird. The Cumbria shootings were Britain's worst since the tragic events of Dunblane in 1996. Memorial services in the towns affected were held on the 9th of June, 2010, a week after the incident. A minute of silence at midday was held. In review, the Home Office Select Committee said that gun law in Britain was a mess, but no new laws would be brought in, and legislation would be kept under review. Instead, an immediate review into gun law guidance was called, which resulted in anyone who has been given a suspended sentence, not being able to own a firearms license.
issues had also been found with a particular health and safety rule. It had stopped paramedics giving urgent medical care to critical patients, because they were reliant on the police to declare an area safe. As a result, this rule was scrapped. Instead, crews would now be able to carry out their own independent safety assessments at serious incidents.